Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BIA Brexit webinar for March 2019. I'm Steve Bates. I'm joined by Laura Collister, our Brexit lead. Um, as you can see, we've had to revise a few of these slides in the last few days. And uh, it starts with the first one. As you know, we like to tell you how many days it is to, to Brexit. We thought it was going to be, be a week, but you can see we've had to put a, a range in for you today as to how many days it is to Brexit. If you're regulars, you'll see we've moved it to 21 days till the first deadline, which is a uh, uh, we'll go into it in some detail, uh, 61 days till 22nd of May. Um, but we are over a thousand days now on since the referendum result. And for those of you who like 80s films, um, uh, Laura's added this one. Marty, I just got back from 2044. They're still working on Brexit. It does feel a bit like that for those of us who are back to the future fans. So I hope um, um, we've got some new people joining us uh, today, as well as some, some regular fans. I hope you'll find in the next half an hour a useful summary of the activity that makes a difference for life science companies focused on BIA member companies. But if you're um, around the globe and uh, checking into Brexit for the first time in a while, I hope from a life science perspective, we can give you uh, some clarity on what's happening uh, and uh, cut through the complexity to the bits that matter. So what we're gonna do today uh, is uh, look at where we are today, what's happening in the next few weeks uh, we'll look at it from a UK perspective, an EU perspective, and then tell you what we are doing as the BIA on your behalf. Uh, as you know, we've uh, established uh, the www.biabrexit.org website, which is a fantastic location for Brexit publications for our sector, uh, public statements and doc uh, documents. And for, for members, you can get access to all of these presentations, member-only briefings, and other activities. So. Um, that's becoming our repository and our portal for um, all of our knowledge. Everything we know is there for you. Uh, I know members have been engaging with it and found it useful. Uh, and do take that uh, website down if you are interested in looking for more after this is finished. Where are we at today? So uh, if you've been with us on the journey over the last couple of years, you'll know this slide. We started with it uh, some time ago in, the, in 2017. Uh, and you can see... Uh, there is negotiations to, uh, to continue uh, discussion at uh, point three of, of, this, uh, of this process. We're still not there, but we're well into Brexit for those of you who followed the journey. And this week we've seen that the Prime Minister hasn't been able to get her meaningful vote in favour of her withdrawal agreement through par the UK Parliament. The Speaker said it couldn't come back uh, in the same format uh, this week. The Prime Minister has endeavoured to meet party leaders about a way forward. We've had uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, visiting Brussels to talk to uh, participants there. Uh, we've had the UK Prime Minister doing a speech to the nation and then finally asking to the EU, asking for an extension to the end of June. A series of unfortunate events, which I believe is a bestseller uh, at the moment. What we've seen finally uh, closing out today is the uh, after the European Council, they've uh, offered uh, a delay to Brexit, and that's been accepted by the, the UK uh, this very afternoon. Um, the, the offer was not what the UK asked for. The offer was a delay until the 12th of April, 21 days' time, if the UK, if the withdrawal agreement isn't passed by the UK Parliament. If, there is, if the withdrawal agreement is passed by the UK Parliament, there's a further delay to the 22nd of May. So it's uh, a series of, uh, of, of, um, of delays, uh, and those are the, the key dates. Uh, we said we would uh, look at what we'd do if there was a delay, and as the delay has finally been agreed, we are seeking to understand as best we can from the government if their requirement of companies have changed. They haven't told us anything yet, but we are seeking quick and clear communications, and there are a series of webinars next week uh, and government comms expected that Laura will take you through uh, in, the, in the coming slides, uh, and that's what we hope will get clarity from the government on what, what this means uh, for the sector. The key thing for us is focusing on what does the government want to do around the stockpiling, the medicine stockpiling work that's been going on, and what their contingency plans are. And just so that you know what I'm doing uh, in lieu of being told what to do is I am keeping going, and uh, we're going to continue as we are, working on present state as is, and move the no deal planning deadline to April the 12th. But keep, keep going on the basis that uh, we need to work towards all contingencies, uh, with simply a change in the date. I think that's what this week means at the end of all of that time. You might remember if you were with us in December, this slide, 
uh, where I said uh, uh, that my uh, fra framing thoughts for how what might happen would would uh, would would be along. Remember before Christmas saying any deal will be driven by a crisis at the 11th hour, the 11th minute. Well, that still seems to be the case. Uh, politicians have a limited understanding of the practicalities that most of our businesses are working to. I don't think that that's changed. Parliament isn't focused on the economic future of the country. I don't think that's changed. That's the, tra that's, the, that's the truth. And in the rolling political crisis, Erskine May, the rule book for the UK Parliament, is more important than Theresa May. Anything can happen and probably will. And I think if you look at the um, uh, the judgments by the speaker, the interventions this week, all of this thesis, um, I think, is still valid and um, probably has stood the test of time um, reasonably effectively. So what's next in Westminster? I expect chaos to continue. Um, uh, I don't know what that will mean, but um, we're used to living with uncertainty in the world of biotech. We'll continue to live with it um, at Westminster as well. Um, Perhaps uh, we'll definitely see some discussion in Parliament on Monday uh, and uh, there, there is the opportunity for Parliament perhaps to take back control. There's a, uh, a new amendment down. We went through this in some detail a couple of webinars ago about how Parliament may choose to, to seek to control the agenda. Who knows whether that will happen? They were within two or three votes of it happening last time round. It could well happen this time round. There may be a meaningful vote three. Uh, that also has been speculated most weeks and didn't happen last week, but probably has to happen quite soon. And then there may be uh, a, 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 an impact for the Prime Minister if the Prime Minister loses uh, that vote. Uh, she has the last two. Um, and I've put lots of question marks on this because um, you are welcome to add your own speculation or consider what might happen to the Prime Minister. I'm sorry, I, I can't give you any greater clarity on this. I think it would be foolish to do so. Um, but uh, that's uh, about as far as the crystal ball goes, which is uh, Monday. What could happen next? Well, basically, there's three things. We could have a no deal now on April the 12th, which would be a cliff edge Brexit with no transition or deal. Um, the, that, that's one scenario. And possibly um, there might be some absolute last minute um, bits and bobs uh, agreed at a, um, a, 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 on a very specific level, which were, I, I call here a managed no deal, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a couple of deals to keep, keep the lights on type thing um, uh, we've seen. Um, we've seen bits of this in thoughts around aeroplanes and such like. Um, perhaps there's some chances for some bits there. Don't know. Uh, there could be a deal uh, agreed by the UK Parliament, which would then lead to the withdrawal agreement uh, kicking in uh, and uh, uh, and trans the UK exiting in an orderly manner on the 22nd of May, a transition part time kicking in and negotiations starting on the future relationship uh, across the summer. Or there could be what I've framed here additional delay, which could happen if uh, the UK chose, as it legally can, to withdraw the Article 50 process um, uh, uh, or uh, parliamentary proceedings uh, take a turn to enable the UK to consider holding European election and requesting a longer exten extension and that would need further EU approval. But I think those are the sort of three buckets that we can see happening uh, beyond that. Importantly, what does it mean for, for BIA members and uh, companies in our sector? Well, if we were to have a no deal on April the 12th, I think we've now got quite a set of government and MHRA technical notices and guidance. Most of those are pragmatic and they would kick in on the April the 12th. I wouldn't say that they are perfect, but we've got a good idea as to how to operate um, uh, or at least as uh, operation of some of them. We then also have the European Council and EMA guidance on the UK as a third country approach uh, going into formality. And again, most uh, companies have been working uh, with that understanding for some time. And we'd see the UK government's Operation Yellowhammer, which is the, the code word for the civil contingency measures, uh, kicking in. Um, if they were planned to go on Monday, I don't know whether they have been delayed as a result of the delay that was announced a, a couple of hours ago yet. Yeah, my guess is that they'll come into, into effect a week before. But if the uh, if the um, bread has been ordered for the bread and cakes have been ordered for the um, for the bunker underneath the MOD, perhaps they'll have the 3,500 troops in there and give them a couple of weeks practice rather than just one week's practice. I don't know. But um, I think from our perspective, it means that the um, that some of the uh, participants that we would engage with, if there were challenges on a no deal, will have time for training. If there is a deal, uh, I think companies can continue to operate and be regulated as as currently. 
uh, in a transition period and the result of the future relationship um, discussion will decide the, the future operating environment. There's a, that's the, the, the key factor for uh, that we'll focus on there. And then if there's a further or additional delay beyond uh, April the 12th or um, May the 22nd, um, we would expect communication from government around uh, what this means for our medicine supply and contingency program and planning program, and I would expect that to depend on the, the length of delay. I think we've got now uh, structures that will enable uh, communication to flow. I know there's lots going on, um, uh, and we would hope that we would uh, get communication in line with that process. What are we going to do for you uh, as the BIA? Well, I hope that we can uh, always maintain uh, flows of information and the webinars I hope are useful. We've got one next scheduled uh, presciently for Friday, uh, 12th of April, which will be the day after, um, or the day of the uh, the next uh, deadline. Um, uh, it, uh, and we'll continue to, to inform you of what's going on. In an no-deal scenario, our, our thinking will always be to put patients first and ensure uh, government communications um, come to you effectively and uh, and uh, get, give you what you need. Uh, I hope we uh, we are now and through meetings and through networks are uh, able to share our concerns. I don't know anybody who's been able to read the volume of material that's come from the UK government in its entirety, particularly the MHRA stuff um, uh, this week. But I think um, uh, you 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 aren't alone. You are with others, and we can uh, both understand what it means, share concerns. And I hope what we can do as, as the BIA is provide a speedy and effective feedback mechanism to government of industry concerns and point you in the direction of the people um, who can help if they uh, if they currently exist. If there is a, a deal, uh, we will um, advocate for our issues to be first in the queue and our positions to be adopted in a future relationship discussion. That could happen quite speedily across the summer. And we'll then seek to both provide insight and gain your um, uh, your expertise and engagement in what would be a further round of, uh, of negotiation. And if there's an additional delay, we would continue um, to keep people informed and expect um, further communication uh, and transmit that to you. A couple of thoughts from, from me, really, before I hand on to um, Laura on some, some facts. These are purely speculative uh, pieces from me. I mean, seems to me that in the next period of time, there's sort of two versions of UK politics. One is Theresa May's endgame um, results in victory. She makes the argument outlined here to Brexiteers, back my deal, it'll get us out of the European Union, I'll go, then you can decide with a new leader of the future relationship, and that gets her the numbers in Parliament. That would then lead, I think, rapidly to a Conservative leadership contest, where perhaps uh, some of the positions that we've seen outlined by leading members of the cabinet would become more important and this could lead to a further dynamic for our sector that we would need to watch as uh, um, uh, as, as those became prominent within the uh, campaign within the Conservative Party for, 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 for new thinking. Um, and I think that's one scenario that I'm imagining might happen, but this is all Steve's um, inward speculation. The second is that the unusual step of Parliament taking back control from the government of the of the legislative agenda happens in the next week. We speculated this might happen. I don't know whether it will happen next week. Along the lines here, you know, this is it, guys. We've got to stop no deal. Sanity must prevail. Um, we've got to do something to do that. If that happens, if they have a series of indicative votes. My guess is that if you did that, would there be a majority for UK becoming something like Norway? Would that lead to a call for longer delay or a revocation of Article 50? Would the Prime Minister be able to continue in that vein? I don't know. Um, and then there'd be renegotiation. And Laura's wisely spotted that um, the numbers in Parliament continue to change. A Conservative MP admitted to expense fraud charges uh, this morning, which may lead to uh, further uh, action in the courts. The timing of that, as we've seen with the, the Labour MP who was put on a tag, can have implications for um, who's able to be in the Commons, and uh, when uh, when votes are on knife edges, it's small changes like this that can can make a real difference. You know, somebody off on maternity leave, somebody uh, you know who's uh, seriously ill, or somebody who is uh, who is um, uh, who is uh, in front of the the courts can make a real difference on these things, which is why it's very hard to to, to call what is a hung parliament in the UK. 
Moving off from my mad speculations to some of the expert work that Laura's been doing. Laura, can you give us an update from your perspective on some of the things we've seen in the UK? So um, there's been lots happening in Parliament. I've not put it all in here, but since the last webinar, we had meaningful vote two, which I think everybody knows um, the government lost. Um, they lost by a smaller margin than last time, but still a significant number of um, MPs voted against the deal. Um, there are also a number of votes on non-binding amendments um, that included um, seeking a second referendum, which was defeated that time. Um, and then the um, speaker said that there couldn't be a third meaningful vote this week without the agreement being voted on being changed because it had been voted on twice before. Um, there could be potentially be ways around this and given um, all the changes it is um, obviously coming back to Parliament next week. Um, we talked about some of the statutory instruments and the bills and the backlog of um, legislation that needs to get through Parliament. If there is no deal there are still lots of statutory instruments that need to get through um, to support the legal framework. The medicines and clinical trials SIs came up um, last week and they were agreed, so they are through. Um, serious shortages protocol um, statutory instrument has been laid. A judicial review was sought by the Good Law Project. That's been initially um, rejected, but they are appealing that ruling. If there is a deal, there are also um, seven bills that would need to get through Parliament before a Brexit day. Um, the figure on the right, the diagram on the right, is all statutory instruments, and um, I took that from the site earlier, and 255 so far this year have made their way out. Um, we'd anticipate quite a lot more coming in the event of a no deal. Um, MHRA promised 80 plus um, documents of guidance on Brexit um, if there is a no deal by the 29th of March. They continue to publish lots of these documents. Um, I think they're up to around 30. Um, quite a flurry came through this week. Um, I understand that, um, so hearing from some people, is um, as we knew they are not perfect, but given the timing, um, I know a lot of regulatory people are just concentrating on understanding and implementing those documents. Um, and we would anticipate if they came to be in a no deal Brexit, that we would then pick up the issues um, after that no deal Brexit when they have, um, when they are um, work, and work collaboratively with them, MHRA. Um, when they're in as opposed to now when the um, priorities are understanding them and companies um, implementing them. Obviously, there's still another 50 to come um, pre-Brexit day. MHRA are also holding a webinar on um, the 25th, which is Monday in the morning around how to make submissions. Um, you can register um, via from on the MHRA on this website on the page. Um, the instructions with the email says, please could you put your organization name in the last name field. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the SIs have been agreed by Parliament and um, Lord Warner kind of highlighted some of the concerns that we'd flagged to him about, um, about the impossible task um, with the amount of detail and system change needed in the event of no deals and how onerous that is on companies, including um, particularly SMEs. Um, despite all the effort and professionalism of the MHRA and um, companies as well. Office for Life Sciences um, are our sponsoring department in government who sits both within the health and business departments. Um, they provide regular updates of collated guidance. We put that on our BIA Brexit website, but additionally, OLS also have a landing page for the industry, which includes all the guidance um, and um, the link is here. Um, we're very lucky that um, OLS have been very responsive to things that industry are asking for. And um, if you have issues, they are a very good team to take those concerns to, especially if it's a specific question around something. If there's a no deal, they will be our route into government, whether it's direct to them or via um, BIA. Um, and they will seek to in, sort of bring information from across government to um, to life sciences companies as they need it and then sort of signpost out the other way. For instance, um, HMRC is obviously very important for companies at the moment. 
Um, there's also been um, further information coming out from the No Deal Medicine Supply Contingency Planning Program. program. Um, we encourage companies um, who to engage in this program. Um, the ferry booking system has now gone live. If you have registered with the Department of Health and Social Care, you would have received the information. If you haven't registered and want to know more, um, this is the email address. Um, and I think we'll just highlight, read the terms and conditions of the document of the booking very carefully. Um, the supply program has also written to industry, um, to those companies that are engaged with setting out the terms of when they would move from no deal planning to um, winding down the contingency. And what they have said is that until um, either withdrawal agreement is ratified and in UK law or the UK definitely leaves without a deal um, and, and it is confirmed the UK leaves without, um, won't be leaving without a deal, they will continue to plan. Therefore, they're asking companies to continue to um, prepare for a no deal and not to wind down contingency plans at this stage. Given the um, possibility of delays, I know that the Department of Health are looking at what communications they should send to companies, um, and this will be influenced by the timing and the length of delays, but they are considering how they communicate. <clears throat> and, and Laura, I think it's fair to say that this letter to, to industry, which has the 29th of March as the deadline in it, came out earlier in the week, which is yep. before the, uh, the, the, the legal uh, exchange of letters, which has moved the, the deadline for no deal into April. So um, that's why this, this has the, the 29th of March date in it, because it's from uh, beginning of the week. I expect to see further updates from the government uh, very soon, but probably um, next yep. week would be my, would be my guess. But yep. I think it's the same thing. Keep going. But the date has moved a bit because uh, an extension has been agreed. Yeah, and for those members that attend the Brexit Lead Network, um, there will be a um, the contingency program team will be at that meeting to provide um, further information on the 9th of April. Um, NHS England has also um, published some no deal communications. These are focused for patients and healthcare providers. But um, I understand that quite a few companies have been asked. Um, by patients on um, around their medicines, and these are a good place to um, suggest that patients might look for further information. So our deal on uh, our view on no deal hasn't changed as a result of um, of, uh, of this week's um, shenanigans. Um, we still call on government and parliament to rule out a no deal Brexit. We think it's the the um, the worst option for the sector. Uh, and uh, will continue to do so. Um, if there is to be a, a no deal, um, perhaps there would be uh, a very last minute bare bones public health essential uh, thinking between the two sides. I think we're some distance from that, but uh, we were planning this really before um, the uh, the agreement was, uh, was was agreed today to delay. So these are some of the things that, um, that we would be thinking around, whether there would be contingency plans, emergency mechanisms, emergency budget, uh, a blame game, a review. A, a, we hope there will be a review of sector SIs and regulation, and we're keen to get your perspective on those, because that, I think, will happen if this was to happen, and then um, engage with different regulators. If there's a deal, we would look to um, work on the negotiations, uh, turn the words in the political declaration into reality amongst um, competition from other sectors, and focus on uh, getting cooperation, um, participation in uh, the science innovation deal and a relationship with the European Investment Bank and Fund. We're ready to go if this is to happen, but um, we're not there at the moment. And our position on the withdrawal and political declaration uh, remains the same as it has for previous months. Um, there's much in it that we could work with if the agreement was to take place, but we are not there yet. Laura, what's been happening in Europe? Um, so we've already talked about the European Council. Um, the um, other thing to flag is that a few weeks ago, which seems ages away now, um, the European Commission, um, DG Sante, um, wrote to the heads of the um, medicines agencies um, around batch release in a no-deal Brexit. 
Um, there has not been any movement on this, um, despite industry seeking um, some flexibility for the last two years. But the letter makes it clear um, that if um, there would potentially be some flexibility, though it does make it clear that you should have um, been going through the process anyway to be able to take advantage of this flexibility. So you had started doing some of your identification, you've you've actually started the process um, and therefore um, are showing that you were intending to move it. I think it shows, Laura, that um, when the deadlines were getting very, very short, there was a degree of pragmatism, which I think is welcome. Um, and if we were to get to, to, um, to another period where perhaps we were a week away from crash out, uh, again, I, I, I think there's potentially the possibility for small pragmatic steps to be seen uh, by all, but who knows, let's hope we don't get there and there is a, a better position uh, as a result of uh, developments in, in Westminster. Yeah, so um, obviously um, we've had quite a lot going on, as you can tell. Um, in terms of what we've been doing over the last month, we've done a lot of external communication and briefings. This is both written briefings, but also speaking to groups, um, doing webinars, speaking at conferences, speaking in at parliamentary meetings. Um, we have provided parliamentary briefings for the statutory instruments as they've gone through Parliament. We've had a further um, ministerial meeting um, with the um, EU relationship group, which is the overarching governance structure for life sciences Brexit work with government. And we have further updated the BI Brexit website. Um, we also continue um, to work with government on their supply contingency planning pro program. And also we have the next Brexit League network on the 9th of April. Um, we had this slide at the start, but here is um, very quickly the address of the website, the BI Brexit website again. Um, the Brexit lead network on the 9th of April will be in the morning. We have updates from the Home Office around immigration, from the Department of Health and Social Care around um, the Medicine Supply Contingency Programme, and um, from the Department for Exiting the EU will also um, hopefully come and provide an update. Um, we take it in turns with ABPI organising this turn time. It is BIA's turn and therefore you sign up on our website and it is for members of BIA and ABPI only. The dates for the rest of the year are also there to help planning. Thanks, Laura. And you can see there's an immense amount of work that's been done and the complexity has gone up. Uh, and I'm afraid the clarity hasn't um, uh, has yet to fully emerge for, for everybody. I realise it's frustrating. And I thought... Um, to cheer us up at the end of the end of the session, before we take your questions, I'd do a couple of quick reflections on what is nearly three years of webinars that uh, that I've been working on uh, with uh, with this. And of course, uh, first of all, I want to jump at the fact that if you looked at it from December, in December we called that it would be a delay, and uh, of course um, that proved to be the case. So occasionally we uh, we get to get it right, um, uh, which is uh, interesting to see. Uh, I was delighted to see that the joke that we used in uh, January from Monty Python was pitched up, picked up in March by um, uh, Mark Rutter, the Dutch Prime Minister. So uh, not only is the policy picked up, but also the, the comedy. And then I looked back as far as, uh, as uh, June 2017, and you can see it was in a previous BIA format here. But um, this we did a, a slide about um, who were losers from the, uh, the general election that had taken place just before then. And it's funny how things turn now. If you look at the three pictures there, uh, Nicola Blackwood, who lost her seat in Oxford, Western Abingdon, is now the Lord's Minister for Knife Science, who we uh, have engaged positively with and uh, uh, is back in working with us on that thing, on much of these things. The second picture here is of Jane Ellison, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, who's uh, a key job at the World Health Organization now and a recent promotion uh, as a result there. And the third picture was of uh, Lib Dem leader Nick Clegg, who's obviously gone off to do a big job at Google. So um, I don't know if Theresa May is tuned in, but if things don't turn out, who knows uh, where things could be in a, in, a, in a couple of years. The other thing that people have said to me in recent weeks is it's really odd. We thought Britain was a very pragmatic, stable, sensible place. It seems to me as if as if the UK has gone mad. And I say, well, no, the UK hasn't gone mad, but it, there is a sense of madness in, in the way that Britain's being run. And of course, that's not without historical precedent because British state has gone mad before. Those of you who follow um, British history, and you'll remember 
that King George III uh, was formally mad uh, and was uh, Britain was run by a regency during his madness, which was 1810 to 1818. And if you're a fan of Hamilton the musical, this is uh, um, he's obviously the king with the second best song, I think, in, in Hamilton. But if you look at what actually Britain was doing during the madness of King George III, not everybody was worried about what was going on in court. A few people were getting on with other things like describing Parkinson's disease for the first time, inventing mining lamps and uh, getting on with the basics of fundamental chemistry through Humphrey Davy. Uh, if, you've, uh, if, you, if you follow um, uh, uh, key women scientists, of course, uh, Mary Anning was uh, hard at work in Lyme Regis uh, discovering uh, key dinosaur fossils, which are, I think probably stand until this week when we've seen some more amazing ones from China as a key, uh, key discovery of, uh, of, of that era. And of course, uh, Britain wasn't only uh, inventing stuff, it was turning it in, in, into commercially viable things like the steam locomotive built in 1812 by Matthew Murray, the twin cylinder Salamanca. So that's what's going on. Whilst the court was mad, lots of things were being invented. I think this is one of the reasons why we have in the UK the standard British approach to the crisis of keeping calm and carrying on. And it's been a moniker that stood by me very well for the last couple of years, and I continue to do it to go it. Another thing I think that you can compare this to is if, if people think politics is mad, look at what's going on in the world of invention and, and real discovery. If you look at it in this, I think the thing that's made the most difference in recent time is the access for NHS patients to CAR T therapy and um, this may not make as many headlines as Brexit, but it is truly a, uh, an epoch-making moment as cell and gene therapies are accessed and delivered to, 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 to NHS patients, um, many of them uh, with discovery or manufacturing stages uh, involved in the UK, which is fantastic. That's why I think we need to not only keep calm and carry on, but we need to keep calm and CAR T on. So I'm, that's what I shall be doing, following both of these agendas. And if you think about keeping calm and carrying on, the positions that members have given us for what we need to do on Brexit remains the same and have been for the best part of the three years, both on regulation, trade, movement of people, R&D and all the rest of it. So uh, you'll be familiar with these if you followed us in detail and we'll keep going with those piece. And of course, the UK sector remains fantastically strong with uh, a resilient entrepreneurial and resourceful ecosystem, well used to managing risk. That's what we do in biotech and drug discovery, drug development and re regulation, with the life science industrial strategy and the sector deals continuing to provide attractiveness to the UK and the fundamentals of the UK, the world-renowned research, the world leader in cell and gene therapies, genomics and AI, and a prag pragmatic, re pragmatic regulatory regime with a strong reputation, large, com large company base producing more than 30 billion of exports. None of this is affected by madness at court. It's more in the invention side of the equation. Thought I'd like to finish with that before taking some questions. If you do have any questions, happy to take them uh, now. Whatever happens, uh, the UK life science sector will do great science, will be, a, will be your partner, and there'll be another webinar. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, we're being asked about the judicial review of the serious shortages protocol SI. What is the issue? Um, so this is the Good Law Project, which is the, the people who were close to Gina Miller, who was the uh, uh, anti-Brexit campaigner who uh, uh, used a legal case to force a uh, force the um, uh, the uh, the idea of a meaningful vote on Parliament on the government a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's the same group who did that, and they're looking at the uh, issues of whether the uh, process by which the serious shortages protocol was brought into Parliament and put through was done properly through due process, and whether uh, it uh, essentially was was consulted upon wrongly uh, and didn't consult patients and doctors. I think is the the, the, yep. the front of that. Laura, have I got that right? Yes. Um, yeah, so it was focusing on um, input from um, professionals around in the consultation process, which was a very short consultation process. Um, and whilst um, government would like to use a series of shortage protocols, if there is a no-deal Brexit, um, 
I believe that these SIs will stand from the serious shortage price by SI will stand even if there is a deal. And I think that was where the consultation piece was hitting is that it wasn't just a Brexit SI. Thanks. Um, we think that that may move rapidly through the courts. It's been um, it's been denied and then allowed to appeal very, very rapidly. So perhaps we'll see rapid movement on it. I don't think it's, it only becomes uh, material, I think, if it's struck out and, um, uh, and, and, and it needs to go to be re-put. But uh, we'll keep people informed if that happens. I take it because we've uh, many of you on the line, but uh, no further questions that we've uh, um, we've answered everything and everything is absolutely clear uh, or certainly there's clarity between now and the weekend for for many of you I shall uh, with this continue to wrap up and suggest that uh, um, uh, if you've any um, if you have any any time please do consider coming to BIA events we've got so we've talked about the brexit lead network on the 9th of April with a networking breakfast in London on the 11th and a webinar on the 12th. Uh, we're taking bookings for the CEO Investor Forum, a uh, Blue Ribbon event in June, which is available on the website, some fantastic uh, panels and um, great networking to be had there. If you're not a member of the BIA, but you are, um, uh, you're interested in joining, John Cudlick would either love to see you at Bio Europe, if you're at Bio Europe next week, uh, or, or uh, get an email from you uh, very soon. Um, as I say, the webinars are always with us, so we will be um, uh, doing this again on Friday the 12th of April. Uh, we think enough things will have happened and changed by then that it's sensible to do one uh, around that time. With that, thank you very much and, uh, uh, and, and have a good weekend. Thank you.